Hey everybody, it's Mr. Gone back with another video. And this time, or maybe we haven't done that many videos, I don't know. But I'm here with a video in any case. So um, something I realized is that we really are not going to have time this year to have a full lesson on the election of 1860, the creation of the Republican Party. And these are very important um, turning points in American history, and some of them obviously still affect us today. So I wanted to make sure that we did that. So we have to get on the way to the election of 1860. In class, we've talked about North versus South. We've talked about various trigger events. Um, and now we need to talk about the actual actual, actual spark, which is going to put us on the very short road uh, to get to our civil war. So this all starts because in America, as you know, we have a two-party system. I've talked about that a lot. Oh, there we go. Perfect. That's so much better. A two-party system. We talked about that a lot. In the civil war, part of the secret sauce that leads to civil war is the breakdown of this two-party system. Doesn't mean you have to like that system all the time. Doesn't mean that uh, we couldn't potentially have something else one day, but historically, when the two-party system breaks down, it can be really bad. So we had the Whigs. For 30 years, we had the Whigs, and they were already kind of losing popularity heading into 1854. And in 1854, they are totally done. They managed to get a couple of presidents in there. Uh, they have a lot of effects in Congress, even when they don't get presidents into office. But after being the second party, the additional party, along with the Democratic Party in 1854, the Whigs are done. They cease to be a national force. This is around the Kansas-Nebraska Act, where Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs um, cannot really reconcile a lot of what's going on. And the Whigs never really do take a strong stance on slavery. And even though you would think that would make it tougher, um, it's going to really drive a wedge into the party that it never recovers from. So remember the Kansas-Nebraska Act is when we get rid of, um, totally, totally get rid of our Missouri Compromise. We start putting popular sovereignty into action and let Kansas choose whether it will be a free state or a slave state. So this is not like the era of good feelings that we talked about briefly in the new nation where everyone becomes one party. It's actually kind of the opposite. So uh, there's going to be a lot of groups floating around there. Some of them will be able to even put in congressmen who will uh, be facing off against Democrats in local elections and governor elections and congressional elections. And it all happens really pretty fast because 1854 is when the Whigs are finally, finally gone. Um, in 1856, the Republicans run their first candidate, but they're really just one of these potential uh, second parties in 1860, obviously, they come onto the scene as a full national party. So you have the know-nothings. Know-nothings tend to be, or sorry, are all about being anti-Catholic and anti-immigration, but they tend to be Northerners because there's a lot more people immigrating to the North. So people who are polarized by that and radicalized by that probably don't live in the South. They live in the North. And so they tend to... Um, be concentrated there. And they do tend to be free soilers. So there's also a whole party called the free soilers. Uh, and these guys will make up the core of the future Republican Party. Free soilers are a one, um, a one issue party. They really just are concerned about keeping the West free of slavery. Some of them are abolitionists. So some of them do want to get rid of slavery everywhere. But the bottom line to become a free soiler is you have to not want slavery in the West. Okay, that is meant as a land, according to free soilers, where uh, people, and they're going to be talking about white men, are going to be able to go and own their own land and farm. And if you have to compete against plantation agriculture, that's actually going to be kind of hard for you to do. So the free soilers are the absolute core of this new Republican Party. There are going to be Democrats in the North who do not like the Democratic policies regarding slavery, and it drives them into the Republican Party. Um, later on. And there are a few people around who are still going to call themselves Whigs and state organizations, though they aren't really going to matter and they'll become Republicans in due course. So the birth of the Republican Party, like I said, it's a hodgepodge. 
Abolitionists, free soilers, some Northern Democrats, former know nothings, and former Whigs made up the early party. Um, so the Republican, uh, their first candidate for president was John C. Fremont in 1856. He has a, he's kind of a hero, well, not kind of, he's a hero from the Mexican American War. He led an expedition to California. They are unsuccessful. To give you an idea of their policies, they want things like, uh, they want a lot of what the Whigs wanted. They want a lot of what the Federalists wanted. So the two poles of American politics are still kind of the same. They like federal power generally. They want tariffs. They want to use the power of the government to help out big business and grow business um, up north. So they gain a lot of popularity in the north with these old Whig policies. The thing that's different about the Republican Party is because they got all these free soilers in it and some abolitionists in it, they take a strong stand. The Whig Party never really took a stand about slavery one way or the other. The Republican Party says, we are free soil, we are free soil, we are free soil. So they are not going to want to push for slavery in the West. They, in fact, want to make sure there's never slavery in the West. Notice I didn't say that they want to get rid of slavery in the South. Most Republicans are not abolitionists. But if you're an abolitionist, you're probably going to end up being a Republican. So most Republicans are not abolitionists. But if you're an abolitionist, you're probably going to end up being a Republican. Okay. You have the election of 1860. So this is an issue because it's a four-way election. That always causes problems in American history. We talk about that with the corrupt bargain. When it's not just two against two. That has to do with how electoral votes are tallied right? The winner take all nature of our states. You really shouldn't, uh, it can get very complicated and rough when you have too many people competing. So this election is a four-way contest. The Democratic Party has their uh, convention and it splits. The Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats literally split. They walk out and you end up in the same city. I want to say it was Baltimore there are two Democratic Party conventions to select who they're going to run for president. That's very bad for your party when they can't even decide who they're going to run for president. You have a bunch of delegates walk out, go down the street and say, fine, we'll have our own Democratic Party. Um, so they are going to have two different candidates run from the same party because now it's based on region. It's not based on party. That's pretty bad. Republican Party is going to dominate the North. Um, there are many states in the South that don't have the Republican Party on their ballot. So to put yourself in the shoes of a Southerner for a second, you guys know I'm, an, I'm a very biased Northerner. I admit that freely. But to put yourself in their shoes, you can think about the fact that Abraham Lincoln will become president. And if you're a Southerner, you never even saw his name on the ballot. So you never even got the chance to vote against him. You have the Constitutional Union Party, which is going to be really popular in future border states, which is basically like, hey, guys, things are getting really rough in America right now. Let's just make sure that we don't like fight, have conflict. Let's try and keep the even course with what we have been doing already. OK, so here we have a graphic. Kind of hard to see. Sorry about that. But you have Abraham Lincoln, he's the Republican, stance on slavery, prevent it from spreading, prevent the spread of slavery. Stephen Douglas, he's the Northern Democrat, and he wants to have popular sovereignty. Okay, so this has been what the Democratic Party has been saying for a long time. This is what the Compromise of 1850 and the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act push a policy like this. Let the territory choose for itself whether it wants to be free or slave. John C. Breckinridge, Southern Democrat. And this is why they walked out of the convention. This is why the convention split. They say slavery should be allowed in all the Western territories because people are moving there. They should be able to take their slaves. It does not matter what that territory wants per se. It's kind of an individual issue. So you run into individual rights meshing with states' rights. It gets really tough that way. Um, and then federal responsibilities. And then last, you have John Bell, who's Constitutional Union Party, who's like, hey, guys, uh, 
how about we just don't have a civil war? It'd be pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool if we like didn't have a civil war. Okay, so save the union. Not even really talking about um, slavery at all. All right. So Abraham Lincoln wins. That's a spoiler alert if you didn't know it. And before he is ever even in office, Abraham Lincoln, remember, he said he doesn't want to get rid of slavery where it exists. He wants to limit its spread in the, in the West. The South is enraged. So South Carolina is the first to secede. Abraham Lincoln is elected in November. This is something a lot of people don't always realize. He's elected in November. And he doesn't take office until March. In the five months in between, you're going to have seven states that secede from the Union. Seven states try and leave America. So secede to break away from a country. Seven states try to leave America. The current president is a Democratic president named James Buchanan. And he does... What is he going to do? Is he going to send troops? Is he going to send supplies? Is he going to try and negotiate? He really does nothing. He just sits there. He says, this is not my problem. This is not my responsibility. Really? Really, James, you can? And so that's what you have going on there. Abraham Lincoln, before he ever takes office, before he ever does a single policy or makes a single decision, seven states are in revolt. South Carolina is the first one. So that's very important to know. South Carolina, first state to secede from the Union. Okay. And we'll talk about where the story picks up later. This is just to fill in the gaps. I had some stuff from before this. I have stuff after this after break. So just want to make sure we filled in the gaps. Have a great day.